Hi everyone. So in the video today we're going to discuss the life cycle of low mass stars, stars that begin their lives with less than about eight or nine solar masses, which is kind of in the range of the cutoff where stars would end up exploding as supernovae at the end of their lives. So first, some usual credits, as a lot of my astronomy PowerPoints have the, a lot of these very same credits. But brief outline, we're going to talk about the formation of stars from the giant molecular cloud and their collapse into a protostar, and then their official birth as an actual star. And then their lives on the main sequence, how long is that going to last? And then the red giant phase, which has a number of different parts, and then ending in a planetary nebula, leaving behind a white dwarf star. So first, I do want to show you some giant molecular clouds. These are regions that contain sometimes as much as a million solar masses. They typically have diameters on the order of about 100 light years. Their interiors can be quite cold. If they were too warm, then they wouldn't end up being able to collapse very well. The gas pressure would be too high. So certain areas in the interiors have temperatures on the order of 10 kelvins. And most of the atoms in these giant molecular clouds are, well, the name, molecules. In other words, they're not um, just an atom by, by themselves. You, you have typically in the forms of molecules like dust or H2, that is di diatomic hydrogen, stuff like that. And they'll often contain clumps that contain dense cores of material with higher temperatures, but even higher densities. And these will be the areas that have the potential to collapse into star forming regions. So the Orion giant molecular cloud, I'm going to show more pictures of these soon. This is the closest and best studied of the large giant molecular clouds. It's about 1500 light years away, 100, 100 light years in diameter. Its mass is over 400,000 times the mass of our Sun. Now it includes the Orion Nebula and the Horsehead Nebula, so here's the constellation of Orion for you. And there's Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, Saif, Mintaka, Alnilam, Alnitak, all the stars that you know from your constellation quizzes. And there is M42, the 42nd object in Charles Messier's catalog of fuzzy things that aren't comets, the Orion Nebula. It's the central part of the Orion giant molecular cloud, which you can see better in an infrared view over here. So just kind of zooming in on this, you have the Orion Nebula here, and there's the Horsehead Nebula, which is also part of this general giant molecular cloud. And there it is again in infrared. And the central part of the Orion Nebula is what we call the Trapezium Cluster. It has four very bright stars, and it also has a bunch of other stars that are difficult to see unless you have an infrared telescope at your disposal, which unfortunately most of us do not. However, a lot of us do have radio telescopes at our disposal. They are called satellite dishes, but unfortunately those are not typically tuned to being able to be useful for astronomy. Now, the Trapezium Cluster is something that actually consists of about 1,800 stars. Now, I mentioned the mass of the Orion giant molecular cloud, 400,000 solar masses. Well, it doesn't form 400,000 stars. The vast majority of the mass in a giant molecular cloud does not end up actually forming into stars, but it needs to be that massive in order to have enough gravity to collapse and form stars. Now, the largest star in the trapezium cluster is about 50 times the mass of our sun. Though there are some theorists who believe that there used to be uh, a star that was even more massive that has already collapsed into a relatively large black hole and accumulated a bunch of other mass. So here is a picture of that trapezium cluster in the middle of the Orion Nebula. And here's a, a view of that area in infrared. Now, there are other large star forming regions out there. One of these is this region right here in the galaxy M33, the Triangulum Galaxy, and this one is much larger than the Orion Giant Molecular Cloud. This is on the order of the same size as the Tarantula Nebula, which is, as you know by now, a large star forming region in the Large Magellanic Cloud. And just starting a little pretty pictures show of some other giant molecular clouds and star forming regions. Here again is the Orion giant molecular cloud. This is Orion on its side. There's Betelgeuse, Bellatrix, Rigel, Safe, Mintaka, Alnilam, Alnitak. There's the Horsehead Nebula. There is the Orion Nebula. But you can see that there's a lot of um, energy around this region, so to speak. Remember, this pink glow is glowing um, 
atomic hydrogen gas. So there is a famous picture of the Orion Nebula. This is a picture of the, the pretty much the whole thing taken by the Hubble Space Telescope. And this is just an overall big view of a picture that is from the Space Telescope Science Institute's website. I think the original picture is something like 18,000 by 18,000 pixels. So that would be 324 um, megapixels. So that's something that would be nice to zoom in if you want to go to the Space Telescope Science Institute website and find that picture. Here is that region overlaid with a picture from the Spitzer Space Telescope showing some infrared view. So notice going back here, up here, back here, up here, back up, back up. Yeah, this is fun. But you can see that as we do that, more stars come into view in the infrared picture. That's because, again, infrared light has a longer wavelength than the sizes of typical dust particles that are in these clouds. And therefore, being a longer wavelength, it's as if the dust particles aren't there. It just goes right through them. So infrared light can be used to get more details and find out more information about some of these dusty regions. Now, here it is again, just kind of a deep field image of the whole area. And then again, that Hubble view. This is a zoom into one of those Hubble pictures showing a newly formed star and the bow shock around it from the stellar winds that have been coming off from that newly formed star. And here's another giant molecular cloud. Here is a very famous one called the Carina Nebula. In fact, at the very center of that, Eta Carina is a star that we've mentioned before. If there's any star that we know about that is most likely to go supernova in everybody's lifetime, it is Eta Carina. And th this actually shows the kind of area around Eta Carina. It doesn't actually show the star itself. But looky there, that's kind of an interesting region. And here's another giant molecular cloud, or at least in a part of it. And here again, you can see one of those bow shocks. Here's another nice one. And it's like this person is holding up a finger, E-T. Here's another nice one. And if you need to pause the video on any of these, please do so. I'm just going to go through a lot of these relatively quickly because we don't want to spend too much time here. Um, here's one apparently giving the middle finger. It's actually called the Keyhole Nebula, but I'm sure that uh, some of you all can come up with more creative names for this. And this is the Lagoon Nebula. It's in the constellation Sagittarius. It's the eighth object in Charles Messier's catalog of fuzzy things that aren't comets, M8. And here's another view of the Lagoon Nebula and a zoom in to part of it. And here is a region nearby called the Trifid Nebula, or the Trifid Nebula, M20. And I'll zoom in to part of that. And here's kind of a normal visible light view of it using the normal color palette that you're kind of used to. And there's another zoom into that, showing the dust area that kind of divides it into three parts, hence the Trifid Nebula. And another nice molecular cloud there. Some more of these. Here's a nice one, the IC1396 star forming region. How do I know that name? Well, it's right here in the lower left part of the image. And here's one with the Spitzer Space Telescope. Here is the famous Eagle Nebula. This is M16. It's also kind of near that area. I forget whether it's officially in the constellation Sagittarius, but it's close. But this is the famous Pillars of Creation region, except kind of maybe not as you're used to seeing it. But zooming in, this is as you're used to seeing it, one of the most famous pictures from the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's part of it. This is an area where stars actually are in the process of forming. We have probably a number of protostars in here. What are protostars? We're going to get to that very soon. But they're kind of blasting off the some of this area with very uh, fast and strong stellar winds. They're, again, they, these are newly forming stars. Here's another nice nebular region. Again, continuing onward, and this is another part, I think that this is part of uh, the Omega Nebula, also called the Swan Nebula, also called the Horseshoe Nebula, also called M17. Here's another nice one, continuing on. 
And here's the Tarantula Nebula in infrared. It's one of the largest star forming regions in the local universe. And zooming into the 30 Doradus star cluster there, um, part of which is the famous star cluster R136. In fact, here it is. There's a zoom in on R136, again, one of my favorite astronomy pictures of all time. And then more star forming regions. There's that region of M33 that I was talking about, the nebula NGC 604, um, similar to the Tarantula Nebula that we saw a little while ago. Again, these are areas, in this case, probably um, millions of solar masses collapsing and forming lots of really big bright stars, collapsing by the mutual gravitational pull of all of the atoms combined together in these regions. And we're going to get to how that works soon. This is a galaxy, and you can see it's kind of active. When galaxies interact with other galaxies, that often sets off waves of star forming region, especially if we're dealing with spiral galaxies, with still, which still have a lot of gas left to form stars. Another star forming region, and more. Here we go. And this is part of the Bubble Nebula. This is the central region of a newly, uh, it's already formed some stars. This particular star has a mass, I think, of about 40 solar masses. It's a blue supergiant star with very strong stellar winds. Here's another star forming region. And this is called the Cone Nebula for maybe obvious reasons. There's the North America Nebula which you can kind of see it. There's the Gulf of Mexico, Florida, and the rest of North America. And there's that same region in infrared. There's the Snake Nebula. This is a dark area that will probably eventually have some regions that collapse into stars. Notice the background here. This is a picture taken kind of looking into the disk of the Milky Way itself. So that's why you have so many stars in this area You're looking right into the Milky Way itself. This is a protostellar region in the Orion Nebula. And notice this kind of glow over here, these jets. These jets are um, kind of exciting gas and forming what we call Herbig Harrow objects. And variable nebula. And again, some jets from young stars and these Herbo Herbig Harrow objects that I was talking about from the Orion Nebula. And again, if you need to stop at any point, then just pause the video. But I'm just going to finish up. Here's the Cat's Paw Nebula and the Heart Nebula. And that's the end. So now back to the main PowerPoint. So how does one actually go from one of these giant molecular cloud star forming regions to um, an actual star? So first you start off with one of these interstellar clouds. And a lot of times it'll just be like that for a very, very long time. I mean, after all, we have these things forming stars right now in the Milky Way, but the Milky Way itself is 12 or 13 billion years old. It formed within probably a billion years or so after the Big Bang. So why are some regions just now forming stars? So, generally speaking, what formed initially in our galaxy was a lot of stars, and there was a time of very active star formation between about 10 and 12 billion years ago, and after that, most of the stars that would eventually form our galaxy, um, at least uh, um, not counting galactic mergers and everything, which we've had a lot of, formed. So what was left over? Well, you still had a lot of gas left over, but that gas was not able to collapse because there wasn't enough mass there. Instead, uh, the outward push of gas pressure was not overcome by the inward pull of gravity until, say, an interaction with another galaxy or the passage through a spiral arm of our galaxy or a nearby supernova explosion or something like that would cause that it to start to collapse. It would provide enough pressure so that part of that giant molecular cloud would start to collapse. And as we've mentioned before, once that collapse begins, it's actually a runaway collapse. It's It happens relatively quickly. We're talking about time scales on the order of a few million years or so before you start to get some well-defined structure, some well-defined structures in there. And then we start to have some fragmentation. This, the, this fragmentation ends up uh, occurring because you have certain areas that are more dense than others until eventually this fragmentation ceases because the inner parts of these fragments are hot enough for 
the gas pressure to kind of slow down the process. But by that point, you're definitely going to be getting stars. In fact, after about 100,000 years or so, you end up having what we call a protostar. The temperature at the center of one of these fragments has risen to about a million kelvins. That's not large enough to have the proton-proton chain, which is what's powering our sun, though of course you will have some deuterium fusion there, but that's not what's primarily actually driving the star. Uh, what's primarily driving the star, and you have a lot of these protostars in these finger-like regions of the Eagle Nebula, what's primarily driving the protostar in this case, as it's kind of making its way toward the main sequence of the HR diagram that we mentioned before, is uh, the Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism. We're dealing with a conversion of gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy. That's, that's the Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism. So eventually though the temperature becomes high enough for the proton-proton chain to initiate and that's when we officially have a star. A star is officially a star once you have the proton-proton chain initiating. And then eventually after a few tens of millions of years you have kind of this uh, continued evolution until it ends up on the main sequence where it is going to spend the next billions of years if it is a star of our sun's mass. In the case of our sun it's going to spend the next 10 billion years um, on the main sequence once it enters the main sequence. Well in the case of our sun it's already spent about four and a half billion years there. It has another roughly five and a half billion years left before it ends up leaving and becoming a red giant. So you end up getting winds and jets during this time of a protostar before it ends up entering the main sequence. I mentioned that before as we were going through the Pretty Pictures show and some of these areas are called herbic hero objects where these jets collide with surrounding material and cause the atoms to glow because they end up uh, energizing them enough to knock off electrons as those electrons recombine you end up having cascading energy levels and they glow. So these jets will also often indicate the presence of newborn stars, even if you can't see the stars themselves. And here is a zoom in on one of those Herbig Hero objects in the Orion Nebula, and this is a um, computer uh, version of how this uh, actually works out. Now. Once the star is on the main sequence, it's going to spend 90% of its life there. We've already t discussed exactly what's going on there with the proton-proton chain in our sun, but long story short, when the star is on the main sequence, it's fusing hydrogen in the core. Not regions around the core, but in the core itself. Now, how that fusion occurs depends on the mass of the star. In the case of our sun, it's primarily by the proton-proton chain. But once you get up to about 1.3 times the mass of our sun, remember the CNO process is the main way that you convert hydrogen into helium, but it's still a conversion of hydrogen into helium in the core. Now eventually though, after in the case of our sun about 10 billion years, uh, you end up getting enough helium in the core that you're not able to have the proton-proton chain being an initiated much any I shouldn't say initiated, but continued much anymore. At that point, the main sequence lifetime is over. So when that happens, we end up not actually generating energy by nuclear fusion. So just reviewing so far, we have our sun converting hydrogen into helium. Now exactly what's going on here? We have every second, something that we discussed before in a previous discussion, 600 million tons of hydrogen are undergoing fusion into helium and e equals mc squared, 4 million tons of that matter ends up getting converted into energy because the helium atom is a little bit less massive than the four hydrogen atoms that end up getting utilized to forming it. Now how does this actually go? How, how long will it take for this to occur for a mass? Well, stars have lots of different masses ranging from about 0 0.08 solar masses to about 260 times the mass of our sun. And there are lots more low mass stars than high mass stars. I should mention though that newly formed stars, um, at least according to theory up to relatively recently, go up to only about 150 times the mass of our Sun. Um, new studies of the R136 cluster are starting to make some, t some scientists believe that some stars in there actually form uh, 
initially with much greater masses than that, because notice I mentioned that stars do go up to about 260 times the mass of our sun. Now, recent studies are indicating that it's possible that maybe these things actually might have formed there. Previously, the idea was that you only got stars of this mass by, say, a few stars that had masses of 100 solar masses or so merging together. But now some scientists are thinking that maybe that's not quite the case, because if that was the case, you would expect different ionization species in these regions, like different types of ionized helium and different uh, abundances of that. But that's not seen. So now some scientists are thinking that some of these stars might end up forming with this mass. How exactly that happens, we don't really know. Computer simulations tell us that um, up up to about 100 or 150 times the mass of our sun, this works, but beyond that, the radiation pressure that you get from this formation will end up blowing off any extra mass and you won't actually get a star that's that massive. So it's really hard to say at this point. So how long does a star live on the main sequence? Well, we've already discussed that our sun will have a main sequence lifetime of about 10 billion years, and that'll be about 90% of its overall lifetime, which is why 90% of stars are on the main sequence, which is why they call it the main sequence, because most of the stars are there on the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. High-mass stars, though, have hotter cores, so that means that the rate of their fusion is much higher, which is why they're much brighter. Now, you might think, oh, well, okay, they're, they're much brighter, but they also have a lot more fuel, so maybe they should be able to live longer than low-mass stars. But it turns out they burn their fuel a whole lot more quickly. We've mentioned before that the luminosity of a star goes as temperature to the fourth power, and these high-mass stars have quite high temperatures. So let's see if we can come up with an idea of how long these things should live. So we've discussed before that a star's uh, luminosity is proportional to its mass to the 3.5 power. So the mass of a star doesn't actually change much during its lifetime on the main sequence, but uh, that mass still has to get utilized in the nuclear fusion process. In other words, once that uh, that mass is used, so to speak, well, now you're dealing with different elements. And when you're dealing with different elements, you're potentially not talking about the main sequence after a while. So that's something to consider. So as we mentioned in a previous slide, eventually the hydrogen in the core is depleted and helium is accumulating. But remember, it takes a higher temperature to fuse helium into heavier elements than it does to fuse hydrogen into helium. So we're dealing with a problem here. Initially, at the birth of our sun, we had uh, a pretty uniform distribution between hydrogen and helium going from core, uh, at the left here, out to the surface over here. In other words, it was about 10% by quantity uh, for all of it, or about 10% uh, helium by quantity, by, by number of atoms, so to speak, uh, or 25% by mass. Now, in the case of the situation right now, which is close to 5 billion years, there is more helium in the core because that has been fused from the hydrogen that was there. And eventually, after about a total of 10 billion years from birth, there's going to be enough helium in the core that the proton-proton chain will not be possible. So, eventually, uh, as, as that's happening, our, our sun is actually slowly getting brighter. It gets brighter by about 10% per billion years, which is why Earth will not be habitable in a little bit less than a billion years or so from now. And eventually, the core having enough uh, helium, it's not going to be fusing any more hydrogen. So how long is that going to take? Well, let's consider an analogy. If our car burns gas at a rate of 2 gallons per hour, depending on how you're driving, how long would a 12-gallon tank of gas last? Well, you have 12 gallons divided by 2 gallons per hour, so just unit conversion there, that's going to be 6 hours. So the time, the, the amount of gas burned is equal to the rate at which it's burning times the time that it burns it, so you can divide both sides by R to get T equals A over R, 
So, for example, a 15-gallon tank burning 3 gallons per hour would last for 5 hours before you have to refill it. So T equals A over R, you have 12-gallon tank burning 2 gallons an hour would last for 6 hours. The same thing works for a star. We discussed in a previous discussion about how the luminosity, which is the energy rate, the, the rate at which energy is being produced by a star is proportional to the star's mass to the 3.5 power. So the rate at which the star is burning energy is proportional to its mass to the 3.5 power. Well, what? how much fuel does a star have? Well, it probably does not take too much guessing to realize that even though we might not have an exact equation for how much fuel it has, the amount of fuel that it has is going to be proportional to the star's mass. So the amount A that it has, going back to this equation, is proportional to the star's mass. I'm not saying it's equal to the mass, but it's proportional to the mass. And again, the rate at which the star is burning fuel, it's not equal to the mass to the 3.5 power, but it's proportional to the mass to the 3.5 power. So that means that the lifetime is proportional to the mass divided by the mass to the 3.5 power, because luminosity is proportional to mass to the 3.5 power. So what does that mean? Well, mass divided by mass to the 3.5 power is mass to the minus 2.5 power. So the star's life is proportional to its mass to the negative 2.5 power. So we know how to deal with these types of proportionalities. We dealt with them when dealing with Kepler's third law. We dealt with them with examples for um, how much brighter a certain mass of star is compared with our sun in the last PowerPoint. So since its lifetime is proportional to mass to the minus 2.5 power, well that means that you can compare two stars. In other words, whenever you have a proportionality, that means that you can take every quantity and replace it with the ratio of those quantities. So so compare two stars. So star 2 and star 1. Well, the lifetime of star 2 divided by the lifetime of star 1 is equal to the mass of star 2 divided by the mass of star 1 to the negative 2.5 power. Well, just compare with one star. Oh, do you know of any star whose lifetime you know? Well, we know the lifetime of our sun. Our sun is going to have a lifetime of 10 billion years. So. What's the mass of our sun? The mass of our sun is one solar mass. So how about we compare with the mass of our sun? So that means that the ratio of a star's lifetime compared with the lifetime of our sun is equal to the ratio of the star's mass compared with the mass of our sun to the minus 2.5 power. Or solving for the mass of the star, um, multiply both sides by or sorry, solving for the lifetime of the star, multiply both sides by the lifetime of our sun, which is 10 billion years, that is 1 times 10 to the 10 years. There's your equation. Let's see how this works with some examples. Um, just some quick numbers after running through some of these figures with some various masses. A star that is 40 times the mass of our sun would have a main sequence lifetime of 1 million years. Although I will say that this formula kind of doesn't work once you start getting up to about 40 times the mass of our sun. A star that's 1.1 times the mass of our sun will have a main sequence lifetime of 7.9 billion years. Again, a little bit less than that of our sun because it's more massive. The more mass of the star, the shorter its lifetime. Big stars live fast and they die young. How about a star that's a little less than the mass of our sun, 0.8 solar masses? That's going to be 17 billion years on the main sequence. How about a star that's 0.4 solar masses? That's going to be 99 billion years, etc. So here's an example. Calculate how long a 6 solar mass star will spend on the main sequence. So writing our givens, here we go. Mass equals 6 solar masses. Remember, the formula, the proportionality relation, is the lifetime is proportional to mass to the minus 2.5 power, which means the ratio of the star's lifetime to the lifetime of some other star, like our sun, is equal to the ratio of the star's mass compared with the mass of some other star, like our sun. Well, what's the mass of a six solar mass star? Well, plug in six solar masses in for this M right here. So that's what we're going to do. In other words, all we need to do is just plug in the number as long as that number is in solar masses and raise that number to the minus 2.5 power. Why? Because if you plug in 6 
m sun right here, well, the m sun units cancel. m sun divided by m sun is 1, so we're just left with 6. So 6 to the minus 2.5 power. And again, multiplying both sides by the lifetime of our sun, that's 10 billion years. That's how we get t by itself. And you get t equals 6 to the minus 2.5 times 10 to the 10 years. Well, how does that compute? That's 0 0.011 times 10 to the 10 years, or 1.1 times 10 to the 8 years. Well, that's 110 million years, less than a billion years. That star is not going to last very long compared with our sun. Our sun was just get, if our sun and this star started forming in the same giant molecular cloud at the same time and started collapsing at the same time, this star would already be through the main sequence by the time our sun reached the main sequence. So that's, again, they live fast and die young. How about a 0 0.15 solar mass star? So. There, there are lots of those types of stars out there. The, the number of 0 0.15 solar mass stars out there far outnumber the number of one solar mass stars out there. So same idea again. Put in the mass in solar masses, raise that number to the minus 2.5 power, and multiply by 10 billion years. And when you do that, you get 1.1 trillion years. So a star that is six times the mass of our sun will live for like just over 100 billion years, but a star that's less than one-sixth the mass of our sun is going to live for over a trillion years. That is a very, very long time. After that, though, they head off to the red giant branch. So what's the red giant branch? It actually has multiple stages. So again, once the hydrogen's been used up in the core, the core can no longer undergo nuclear fusion in the case of something like our sun. So what happens? Well, what's hydrostatic equilibrium? Remember hydrostatic equilibrium? Hydrostatic equilibrium is that balance between the outward push of, radi of radiation and gas pressure and the inward pull of gravity. Well, nuclear fusion is no longer there. So there isn't that outward push of radiation pressure. So what happens? Gravity wins, and the core starts to collapse. Now, this isn't a complete collapse. This isn't going to become a black hole or anything in the case of our sun. But for a few thousand years, there is a conversion of gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy as that core is collapsing. You go from something big into something smaller. Gravity is um, converting that potential energy into kinetic energy. Well, that's producing heat. That heat now from the conversion of gravitational potential energy into kinetic energy, that's what's powering the star, not nuclear fusion. Where have we come across this before? This is the Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism that we've discussed in what's um, powering Jupiter in, in the center of Jupiter and why Ju the center of Jupiter is so hot. That's what was powering our sun for the first hundred million years after it started forming, etc. This is what's going to power a star as it's about to become what we call a red giant. But eventually, this stops. Eventually, this Kelvin-Helmholtz mechanism becomes hot enough that the area outside of the core is able to undergo nuclear fusion. It starts to collapse and accumulating heat from its collapse and everything, it starts to undergo nuclear fusion. So why did that happen? Well, what was going on outside of the core? Well, outside of the core, you had a lot more hydrogen than you had helium for a while because after all, the fusion of hydrogen and helium was happening, well, in the core. But now the core is collapsing, that area outside of the core, it was close to being hot enough to undergo the proton-proton chain or whatever process that particular star would undergo, well, now that the core is collapsing, it is able to undergo nuclear fusion. This is additional energy, and it is going to be quite significant. This is an area outside of the core. So here's your core, here's your region outside of the core. It's a much bigger region than the core, much greater surface area. What does much greater surface area mean? It means much more energy is going to come from this process. That energy is going to be enough to cause the star, the outer layers of the star, to expand very significantly. And that is what we call a red giant. So the outer layers expand, but as they expand, they cool down. So the color of what you actually see for the star becomes redder. The temperature ends up becoming cooler, and that's why we call it a red giant after all, instead of yellow, it's red because it's cooler in temperature, and the star is leaving the main sequence. It's much 
brighter in terms of overall luminosity because it's much bigger, but the temperature is cooler. So from the HR diagram, it's going up and to the right, as you can see right here in the case of a one solar mass star. It ends up going up and then toward the right as the temperature ends up getting cooler. Notice going toward the right means cooler temperature. So it's a red giant. What exactly happens in the red giant branch? Well, that depends very, very strongly on the actual mass of the star. So you notice that here we have a number of different paths depending on the mass of the star. Um, for example, a, a three solar mass star ends up going back and forth, but it ends up going more, more strongly this way, etc. Now, the exact path that you see, or the exact track for, say, a one solar mass star, that also depends on what type of diagram you're looking at. In other words, how, how scaled it is logarithmically and stuff like that. Size comparison. So, here is our sun, this little dot right here, which we can zoom in on. When our sun becomes a red giant, at, at its biggest stage, that is, it's going to have a diameter on the order of about two astronomical units. What's an astronomical unit, remember? That's the average distance between Earth and sun. So its diameter is potentially going to take it out to Earth's current orbit. Is that going to result in Earth getting eaten up? Well, that's something we're going to discuss soon. It's debatable, long story short. So now is a good time to stop the video and maybe write down on a sheet of paper or turn to somebody next to you or a parent or something and summarize the evolution of a star off the main sequence into a red giant, starting from where, what it was doing on the main sequence. So pause the video and when you're done with your summary, then restart the video. So hopefully you've done your summary now. What you should have is that when the star is on the main sequence, it is fusing hydrogen into helium in its core, and then it the core gets too much helium in it, and fusion turns off, so the core collapses, and as the core collapses, eventually hydrogen fusion into helium begins in a shell around the core, and then as that happens, the star becomes a red giant. Now, why is some of this useful? I mean, yeah, it's nice to know the ages of stars and or at least what stars do and all of that, but we also want to figure out the ages of clusters. And I mean, something that we realize is that there are certain objects in our galaxy that are some of the oldest objects out there in the universe. So we can use the fact that in a cluster, all star stars form roughly simultaneously and then in that cluster just plot the stars that are in that cluster on a Hertzsprung-Russell diagram. And keep in mind that since the most massive stars burn through their fuel most quickly and thus leave the main sequence most quickly, you can figure out the age of a cluster based on where the there are no longer really much in the way of stars to the upper left of the part of the main sequence. Because remember, going back to the main sequence from a previous lecture, we had that as you go up and to the left on the main sequence, you're talking about younger, more massive stars. But if they all form at the same time in a cluster, that means they all have the same age, which means the ones in the top left of the main sequence blow up as supernovae first, and then the ones a little bit lower right of that do that do the same thing just a little bit later time and then eventually you start getting into stars that don't go off as of supernovae that simply go off into the red giant branch and that's it and then you after say a few more billions of years you go even farther down to the right so the certain point in the HR diagram in which a star has not yet burned its main fuel to the stage beginning into the red giant uh, branch is something that indicates the age of the cluster. That's what we call the main sequence turnoff. And the position of that is used to determine the age. Let me show you. This is a an HR diagram of the globular cluster M3. Globular clusters, remember, are very tightly packed groupings of often hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of stars. And if you plot all of them on an HR diagram, you get something like this. And the point 
where you have this kind of going up and then toward the right, that is the main sequence turnoff. And here you have your red giant branch. Notice there is naturally some scatter to this, um, some of that having to do with slight differences in chemical composition, rotation rate, um, degree of convective overshooting, stuff like that. But Overall, you can kind of come up with an average location, so to speak, the main sequence turnoff, and that indicates the age of the cluster. Now, there are some stars that kind of continue off a little bit over here, and these were a puzzle for astronomers for quite a while, and we now recognize that these are what we call blue straggler stars. They are stars that in these very tightly packed globular clusters, you have occasional collisions and when you have a collision um, between two stars it's almost as if you have a um, more massive younger appearing star being reborn but in any case those are relatively rare you still have your general trend and the general trend in a cluster where they all form at the same time is that you have a certain main sequence turn off and here you have your red giant branch. This is the horizontal giant branch where certain other things are occurring that we're going to discuss very soon. And this is a picture of M3. Now, the clusters, the globular clusters, these are some of the oldest objects in the universe. And that's why we know that. We know that they're some of the oldest objects in the universe because of these main sequence turnoffs. They're not all incredibly old, but they all are relatively old, and some of them are extremely old. Some of them are like 13 and a half billion years old. Now, I should mention it's relatively difficult to determine the age of an individual star when it's on the main sequence, unless it's in a cluster. There are ways that we're starting to um, improve nowadays, but we still don't have a very good way of determining with within, say, a few percent the age of an individual star, unless it's in a cluster. So, summary so far for the evolution of low-mass stars. A star exhausts the hydrogen in its core. The helium core begins to shrink, heats up. The hydrogen burnt begins fusing into helium in a shell around the core, and that causes the outer layers to expand and become a red giant. Now, with stars that are more than 0.8 times the mass of our sun, eventually the core will reach a temperature of 100 million kelvins and something very special happens at a hundred million kelvins. That's something called the triple alpha process. So here's the idea. We call it triple alpha because remember helium four nucleus is also called an alpha particle and there are three of them that get involved into making a carbon 12 nucleus. Here's how that happens. Remember, you've, you certainly learned back in chemistry that when chemical reactions take place and you have complex reactions occurring, you generally do not have three molecules or atoms colliding into the reaction all at the same time. Instead, two of them react, and then that reacts with a third. The same thing happens here. An alpha particle plus another alpha particle gives you a beryllium-8 nucleus plus a gamma ray because the uh, mass of a beryllium-8 is a hair less than the mass of two helium-4s. But here's the thing. The half-life of beryllium-8 is something like 8 times 10 to the minus 17 seconds. We're talking about about 80 attoseconds. And that's going to just bust apart immediately before a helium-4 can react with this. But it just so happens that there is a quantum mechanical resonance between beryllium-8, helium-4, and carbon-12. It's one of the most miraculous situations in nature. If that quantum mechanical resonance did not exist, then this reaction would be much more difficult to occur. In fact, you'd have far less carbon-12 in the universe. And remember, carbon-12 is one of the bases for life as we know it. So if this uh, quantum mechanical resonance did not exist, um, life would be far rarer in the universe. The only way you would get carbon-12 would be through other sorts of nuclear reactions that have a much lower frequency. But in any case, because of this resonance, that um, ex significantly extends the half-life of beryllium-8 when there is a helium-4 nucleus nearby, which there is, I mean, it's the dense core of a star, and then allows that beryllium-8 to collide with carb a helium-4 to create a carbon-12. So, again, 
it's that resonance between beryllium-8, helium-4, and carbon-12 that really allows this to exist. The end result is that three helium atoms fuse into a carbon-12 nucleus. Now sometimes this continues a little bit onward and you end up getting um, heavier species as well, especially with reactions with protons, but this is the main reaction that we're looking at in this case. So, for example, you can get carbon-12 plus helium-4 into oxygen-16 and then further on into neon-20, but uh, this is a little bit rarer than just stopping at um, carbon-12. But the fact that some of this does end up going into oxygen-16 combined with what ends up happening a little bit later in the lives of stars uh, results in the fact that there actually is a little bit more oxygen in the universe than there is carbon, especially when you're talking about the CNO process that occurs in slightly more massive stars than our sun. And in our sun as well, it's just it only makes up something like 1.3 percent of the nuclear reactions in our sun. So anyway, that leads to the most common elements in our universe being in order hydrogen, then helium, remember those formed during the Big Bang, then oxygen, then carbon. Now, eventually, you get enough of this happening that this is really a chain reaction. And that is known as the helium flash. And this it, it, we call it the helium flash because once it starts occurring a little bit in low mass stars like our sun, it really starts occurring a whole lot. Um, when I talk about low mass stars, in this case I'm talking about stars less than about two times the mass of our sun. In fact, I should mention that the uh, helium flash only occurs in stars between 0.8 solar masses and 2 solar masses, not 0.4 solar masses. But the with stars that are more massive than that, it's not really so much of a flash as opposed to just a gradual process. Um, in fact, you, you don't necessarily even have fusion turning off in a lot of those stars. It's just, it just gradually shifts over to helium fusing into carbon and oxygen and neon and magnesium, stuff like that, when you're talking about stars that are, say, six times the mass of our sun. So, in any case, when this happens, this actually causes the star to shrink a little bit, just due to some of the various um, hydrostatic equilibrium processes at different levels in the star. And then this happens in different areas throughout the star as well, outside of the core. And in particular, the asymptotic giant branch is when this happens in a relatively large shell around the core. So anyway, conversion of helium to carbon proceeds at a very fast rate. For example, a star is going to use up all of its helium in about 100 million years. Remember, we're talking about a solar mass star here. It spent 10 billion years on the main sequence fusing hydrogen into helium. But it finishes fusing helium into carbon after about 100 million years after that process starts. So once it's converted all of its helium to carbon, it can no longer maintain hydrostatic equilibrium. And the core contracts again. Sound familiar? Well, eventually you end up getting um, helium shell burning, just as you had hydrogen shell burning uh, before. And then outside of your helium burning shell is a hydrogen burning shell. And you might also might have um, a little bit of an ash shell, so to speak, that's not really doing anything um, outside in between the hydrogen burning shell and the helium burning shell. But in any case, that causes the outer layers to expand, becoming cooler and redder. The star gets brighter, even brighter than it was before. We call that the asymptotic giant branch, as I mentioned just a little while ago. Now, during this process, there's a lot of convection happening at various levels in the star. This convection ends up churning up the different layers of the star, and you end up getting protons interacting with heavier elements. And also, along with these protons, you end up having, well, Guess what? There are neutrons around. There are neutrons around. And neutrons love interacting with other nuclei because 
they have no charge. They're not repelled by any um, electrostatic repulsion or anything like that. But they love to interact with the strong nuclear force. So once they get close enough, they just latch onto that nucleus. We're going to talk a little bit more about that later, and by later I mean relatively soon, because this forms a whole lot of the elements on the periodic table. So, in any case, eventually the contracting carbon core core. Um, it contracts enough um, that it might be sufficient to burn some carbon into heavier elements, but we're talking about, when I talk about heavier elements, I'm talking about a little bit of oxygen and stuff like that. It's not a very um, intensive process where you end up converting the entire thing into oxygen or anything like that. Um, so, other than a few reactions between carbon and helium-4 into oxygen-16, you're not really going to have uh, further nuclear reactions in the core. So what happens? Well, during this asymptotic giant branch, the star casts off its outer layers, and you end up having leaving behind a white dwarf core. We're going to get to that soon as well. So as all this is occurring, the star is losing mass. By the time our sun reaches its helium flash, it might lose as much as half of its mass. And each time you end up getting these helium shell flashes like we saw in that diagram back here, the star loses a little bit more of its mass. There we go. So that, that was your review. Here's your review again. So it loses even more mass, and it's believed that by the time our sun ends up shedding off all of its outer layers, the core is only going to be, at most, maybe about 50% of the sun's current mass. <clears throat> so the shocks from these various interactions end up exciting the atoms in the expelled gas, and you end up getting a, a planetary nebula. So here's a picture of one of those. And again, we're going to have more to say about those soon. So in any case, leading up to this planetary nebula, take a moment to pause and summarize the steps in the life of a sun-like star after it leaves the main sequence. So pause the video and either write these down or turn to a partner or somebody around and uh, try to recall what you know. So hopefully you've done this, and hopefully you have the following steps. You have hydrogen shell burning. Uh, this is the beginning of the red giant branch. And then there's the helium flash. That's where the star enters the horizontal giant branch. And then you have helium shell burning, and even hydrogen shell burning surrounding that. There you're dealing with a star entering the asymptotic giant branch, where it's larger and brighter than ever. And then it ends up shedding off its outer layers into a planetary nebula. We're going to get to those in a little bit more detail soon. Now, I should mention a little diversion. Red dwarf stars. Red dwarf stars are by far the most common stars in the universe. And as I mentioned earlier, red dwarf stars do not have, they, they never start fusing helium. It, it, it requires a star to have at least 0 0.8 times the mass of our sun to start fusing helium. And by most definitions, uh, the maximum mass of a red dwarf is typically about 0 0.6 times the mass of our sun. There are some definitions that put it up to 0 0.8, but mostly you're talking about a maximum of about 0 0.6 times the mass of our sun. So it's currently believed that there are about four times as many red dwarf stars in the universe as there are all other types of stars combined, if you ignore these brown dwarf objects and there might be fewer of those than one might think in any case. Now, I've already mentioned red dwarf stars as potentially being um, having planet or life-bearing planets around them, uh, just depending on whether those the atmospheres of those planets are able to survive the star's active young phases. But in any case, red dwarf stars are stars with masses less than 0 0.6 solar masses. And in order to undergo the helium flash, which never occurs in red dwarf stars, the star's got to be more than 0 0.8 times the mass of our sun. Now, it also turns out that stars with a main sequence mass of less than 0 0.23 times the mass of our sun never even have a hydrogen shell burning phase. What does that mean? It means they never enter a red giant phase. In other words, they just complete continue just fusing on and on, and how can that happen? Well, we're, we're about to see, because red dwarf stars, at least the less massive of them, do not have a radiation zone. 
um, the lower mass red dwarf stars, in fact, ones that have uh, masses of less than 0 0.35 times the mass of our sun, the entire star is a convection zone, even in the core. You have a convective core and then a convective envelope all the way out of the surface. You're dealing with constant convection. So instead of just slowly building up to uh, too much helium in the core and then eventually the core collapsing and then you get um, hydrogen shell burning, stuff like that. Instead, these stars continuously recycle this material throughout the star and throughout the star's life, it's a constant... Um, it's, the ratio of hydrogen to helium is constant with respect to radial position in the star. In other words, remember with our sun, after 10 billion years, you have way more helium in the, in the core compared with hydrogen than you do in the outer layers of our sun. Not the case in a 0 0.3 solar mass red dwarf. Something to keep in mind. Examples. Well, Proxima Centauri, the closest star to our sun. We've talked about that before. It requires good binoculars or a telescope to be able to see that thing. Its mass is 0 0.122 times the mass of our sun. So it's about 5 billion years old right now. Well, it turns out if you plug this number into that lifetime formula that we talked about earlier, that means it's going to live for about 1.9 trillion years before it stops nuclear fusion altogether. Another star that we've talked about in this unit in a different lecture, Barnard star, the one with the largest measured proper motion, that's also a red dwarf star. You can't see it with the unaided eye. In fact, the brightest red dwarf star in the sky is the star um, Lasai. I'm not sure how that's pronounced. I'm assuming it's a French name or something. Lasai 8760. That has an apparent magnitude of 6.69, which means you need to have pretty good nighttime vision from a very dark observing site in order to be able to see this thing. And that has a mass of 0 0.6 solar masses. So here's an artist's impression of a red dwarf star. So these things are small. They're not all that much bigger than the planet Jupiter. They're maybe typically like one and a half times the mass, the, si the radius of Jupiter, that sort of thing. And they are red in color because they are cool in temperature. They have luminosities considerably less than that of our sun. We're talking about one one thousandth of the sun's um, luminosity. So a give you a moment to write a summary about red dwarf stars. So I would say the main elements in the summary that you should have included would be that the lower mass red dwarf stars are completely convective and they never have they they no red dwarf star will ever start fusing helium into heavier elements in a chain reaction in the core and they live to be that they have very long lives so those are kind of the main things to be concerned about with red dwarf stars so helium core fusion never occurs and white dwarf stars that would be left over from these things by the way are composed mostly of helium well have we ever found such a white dwarf that's composed mostly of helium? I mean, we've talked about white dwarf stars a little bit before. I'll just tell you now, they're all composed of mainly carbon and heavier stuff, mainly carbon and oxygen. Well, why? Why haven't we found any of these theoretical objects? Well, if you plug your number of 0 0.6 into our magic equation of figuring out the lifetime of a star, so 0 0.6 solar masses, so plug in 0 0.6 to the negative 2.5 power, you find that a, um, a star starting off with 0 0.6 solar masses is going to have a main sequence lifetime of about 36 billion years. Well, guess what? The universe hasn't been around for 36 billion years. So that's a very good reason why we have not seen any of these helium-only red dwarf stars. However, the universe has been around for 14 billion years, which gives us easily enough time to be able to see these carbon-oxygen carbon white dwarf stars. So... The rest of these we've already discussed, so now it's time to move on. Intermediate mass stars, I should mention, some of these have radiation zones outside of their convection zones, unlike our sun. For example, say like a four million, or sorry, a four solar mass star will have, instead of its convection zone being outside of the radiation zone like our sun has, the radiation zone will be outside of the convection zone. 
One of the big things about intermediate mass stars, though, is they can have what we call a super asymptotic giant branch, where they end up fusing a lot of heavy elements by S-process nucleosynthesis. So it's also very important for stars less than about three and a half solar masses as well, because these uh, make up a reasonably large proportion of the stars out there, and you can get a lot of heavy elements like this. So what you're dealing with, again, is you have a lot of this convection happening during the late processes of a star's life, and that allows the heavier elements that are formed by fusion to interact with neutrons. And when this happens, these this slow neutron capture ends up leading to um, relatively heavy nuclei. Now, you might think, it's like, well, wait a second, shouldn't the atomic number stay the same? After all, these are neutrons. But remember, once you start accumulating a lot of neutrons in your nucleus, that means that you're going to have beta decays and that sort of process. And these beta decays will end up le leading you up to higher atomic numbers with the same atomic mass. So what kinds of elements are created like this? Well, it turns out that about half of all of the naturally occurring elements after iron on the periodic table are produced not just in supernova explosions, but actually by S-process nucleosynthesis. There's this big um, thing out there that you might have heard if you've hung out on these shady street corners out there. You might have heard people whispering that you can only form elements after iron by supernova explosions. Well, that's not true. Actually, a whole lot of the elements after iron are formed by S-process nucleosynthesis in the late stages of the lives of sun-like stars. Now, I will mention that gold and uranium are not formed like that. They're actually formed by various types of supernova explosions. So, in fact, its S process is particularly relevant for atomic nuclei with masses between about 90 and 204 AMUs. So I mentioned these super asymptotic giant branch stars. You can have S-process nucleosynthesis in some of these, although th that tends to produce different elements. But these can end up actually giving you um, what you might consider to be red supergiant stars, except ones that don't end up exploding as supernovae. So these are relatively rare as things go, but there are probably some of them out there. I should mention that these occur if you're dealing with a star with, say, like seven times the mass of our sun or something that is able to achieve a core temperature of 600 million kelvins. That is actually enough to fuse carbon-12 with carbon-12 to create magnesium-24. But most stars that are able to do that end up going supernova. So in any case, though, for these types of stars as well as sun-like stars eventually you end up shedding off the outer layers leaving behind a planetary nebula with a central white dwarf star. These central white dwarf stars are very high in temperature they have a lot of ultraviolet and x-ray light and that's able to ionize the surrounding gas. What kind of surrounding gas? Well here is a nice picture of one of these things. You're often dealing with oxygen gas in these things. Oxygen and carbon have been created in the star during its lifetime, and as the outer layers of the star are shed off, again, they've been mixed via, via convection with what was in the core, and you end up having ionized species, and you create some relatively colorful objects, like this, and this, the hourglass nebula. Now, kind of going back somewhat, um, eventually these things are going to become very, very cold because they don't have a way of producing energy at this point, and they're eventually going to fade into the background. Well, what kind of time scales are we talking about here? Planetary nebulae, typically the ones that we see, are on the order of about 10,000 years old. They don't last long. There aren't a whole lot of them in our galaxy. I mean, yeah, they're, they're, they're like tens of thousands, I'm sure, but you're not talking about anything on the same order as the 400 billion stars that are in our galaxy. After 50,000 years, a planetary nebula has expanded enough that it kind of dissipates into the surrounding interstellar medium and just sharing its dust in with the rest of the dust that's out there forming the stage of eventually forming new stars, recycling of stellar material, so to speak.
Now, what about the white dwarf star itself? The white dwarf star will eventually end up cooling. I should mention that some of these planetary nebulae can expand much faster than what one would normally expect due to various stellar winds, and the result of that expansion can actually cool them down to much colder temperatures than, say, any, anything near the temperature of the central white dwarf star itself. For example, this nebula that I've been showing you right here, the Boomerang Nebula, um, Parts of it have temperatures on the order of 1 Kelvin due to this excessive, excessively rapid expansion and cooling. Now, the cosmic microwave background radiation, the radiation left over from the Big Bang, the temperature of that is about 2.7 Kelvins. So, again, some of these planetary nebulae. Now, the transition from an AGB star, an asymptotic giant branch star, to a planetary nebula takes place on the order of decades. So uh, this is a picture of one of these that was taken back in the 1990s, but now, more recently, um, I think this picture was taken in the, uh, let's see, that partic particular picture was taken um, maybe in the early 2000s, I mentioned that 2002 in that last slide, though this one, this particular one might be a little bit more recent than that, but there were some noticeable structural changes between the 1990s picture and the more recent picture. So yeah, these planetary nebulae can, especially in the just recently asymptotic giant branch phase, can evolve quite rapidly. Now, what will happen to Earth in our solar system? So, just before our sun's helium flash, our sun will be a thousand times more luminous and a hundred times larger than it is today. That will be enough, certainly, to eat up the planet Mercury. But, as our sun is growing, it's also, remember, losing mass. What is it that holds planets in orbit around the sun? It's the sun's mass. Well, if our sun is gradually losing mass, that means the planets are going to migrate into farther orbits. So, when our sun reaches its maximum size, Earth isn't going to be where it is right now. If you're just talking about our sun losing mass, it's going to be in a farther orbit. It might be about where Mars is orbiting right now, because, I mean, you're talking about the same velocity of the planet's orbit, orbiting around a smaller star, that means the orbit's going to be a bigger orbit. Now, recent computer simulations with our sun retaining half of its mass by the end of the AGB branch, well, in that case, Earth and possibly even Venus might eventually be able to escape being engulfed. Obviously, we would get, we would get baked because we would be talking about a much larger star and life on Earth would no longer be possible, but nonetheless, it's uh, we, we might end up escaping as a planet. Now, these white dwarf stars, I've met, we already talked about those a little bit previously, but the first one was discovered in 1862. That was the companion star of Sirius, the brightest star in the night sky. The companion star, it has a mass uh, more re most recently estimated as 1.02 solar masses. Surface temperature 25,000 kelvins. Its luminosity is about 1 20th of our sun's luminosity when you include the radiation at all of the wavelengths, especially things like ultraviolet and x-ray where it emits a lot of energy. Its radius is smaller than Earth. So you might wonder, what can possibly support these things against the force of gravity? Why shouldn't they collapse entirely? Well, we're going to talk about that in a future PowerPoint. So, long story short, the evolution of these things after the red giant branch, they very quickly end up casting off their outer layers and end up becoming a lot dimmer, but they're still high in temperature. So we're talking about moving very quickly over to this side of the HR diagram, where remember temperature increases going toward the left of this thing, and there's the main sequence. And your red dwarf stars are in this general region. So that's it for our discussion of the lives and deaths of low-mass stars like our sun. Uh, if you have any questions, then please ask in the comments section, and I'm going to end with showing some pretty pictures of some planetary nebulae. So here's a picture of one as it would appear if you were looking at it through a large telescope. Our eyes are relatively susceptible to the blue light that 
these things tend to have in them. We're, our eyes are not as sensitive to the red light, which is also there, which is why you, you tend not to see the red light in the Orion Nebula and stuff like that, in spite of the fact that you see so much red when you look at pictures of the Orion Nebula. But our eyes are quite sensitive to the blue light. This blue light, in this case, is coming from oxygen atoms. And there, there are various ionization species of oxygen that can lead to blues and greens and stuff like that. Here you have a little bit more red in this picture, more hydrogen. The amount of hydrogen relative to things like carbon and oxygen just depends on the uh, history of the star itself. Here's something called the egg nebula, sometimes called the rotten egg nebula because it has some sulfur in it. And then the stingray nebula, we saw that already. Then the bug nebula, the spirograph nebula, Cleopatra's eye. Notice this has a nice green little uh, area in here, then with the pupil, the green, uh, you're also talking about different uh, ionization species of oxygen. And then here's another one from the Hubble Space Telescope, the Retina Nebula, you can kind of see why it has that name. And here's another picture of it using different filters. Here's another planetary nebula, with a bit of green, and some more, Silkworm Nebula, and this one might be a more modern picture of the Saturn Nebula, I'm not sure. Here's the Butterfly Nebula. There's the famous one, the Dumbbell Nebula, M27. This is visible, it's in the constellation Volpecula, which is near the constellation Cygnus, and it can be seen in a relatively modest sized telescope. I will tell you though, it is big. When I saw it for the first time in the telescope, it was much bigger than I was expecting, but it was very dim. In other words, like it took me a while to realize that I was looking at it because it was so diffuse. In other words, the light was spread out throughout the um, viewing area. Here's a zoom in from the Hubble Space Telescope into it. There's the Ring Nebula, another very famous one, the 57th object in Charles Messier's catalog of fuzzy things that aren't comets, and at the center of that you can see the white dwarf star there. Very nice. And there's uh, M97, the Eskimo Nebula, sometimes called the Owl Nebula. There's a better picture of that here taken by the Hubble Space Telescope, and you can kind of see why it's sometimes called the Eskimo Nebula. And here's another one. Notice a nice uh, outer shell of uh, hydrogen glowing there. And some more. The Hourglass Nebula, the Ant Nebula, the Giant Squid Nebula. You can see where some of these things get their names. And again, just pause the video if you need to spend some more time enjoying some of the beauty of these things. They are some of the most beautiful objects out there. This is often called the Southern Ring Nebula. I think the central white dwarf star is supposed to be the little one right there. And some more. Turtle Nebula. Butterfly Nebula. And then the Cat's Eye Nebula which can be seen, um, trying to remember where the Cat's Eye Nebula is, I want to say that it's relatively close to Cygnus, but it's NGC 6543, if you have a telescope that you need to just program the name into. More recent view from the Hubble Space Telescope. And there's the Saturn Nebula, an older picture of the Saturn Nebula from the 1990s. And there is the uh, Helix Nebula, another famous planetary nebula, and one of the biggest ones in the sky. There it is in infrared with the Spitzer Space Telescope. There, the Medusa Nebula. And that's the end of that. So again, if you have any questions about any of this, please let me know in the comments. And otherwise, thank you for watching.